Hello, Elder Smith here. In the last video, I covered over the first point of Calvinism. And today, in this video, I'm going to cover over the second point. Now, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the last video, uh, each uh, first letter of each point is supposed to form the word tulip. And um, the T, which is the first point, is total depravity, which we covered over. How that we can't do anything that's pleasing to God that's of ourselves. Because we are born sinners into the world. We are born dead. We need God's spirit and his blessings to help us so that we can do the things that are pleasing to God. And it is through his mercy that we can, and it's th through his help, as uh, Paul mentioned, he can do none of these things, but in Christ he can do all things. Showing that with man... It is impossible, but with God all things are possible, which is also what Jesus said in the Gospels. But this next point, which is the U, is, stands for unconditional election. Now, you've heard me talk about election time and time again. In fact, um, I, the, the video where I touch on it as the main subject is actually my th fifth video that I've ever posted. But... That, but in this case, not only am I going to be talking about election, but I'm going to be talking about unconditional election. You see, the truth be told, nobody knows why God chooses who he chooses. And uh, it's not because we have done anything to earn it. Because if we have to earn uh, our, our place of being one of God's elect, then that... That contradicts the first point, which is total uh, depravity. Well, if we can earn it, then that first point has been made false already. But then some people are saying, well, but Elder Smith, doesn't it say that you have to accept Christ? That you have to let him into your heart? Well, where does it say that in the scriptures? Well, what about the parts where it says, any man that proclaims out loud with his mouth that Jesus is the Christ shall be saved? Well, we covered over that in the last video. In order for a man to be able to do that, he ha God has to give him his spirit first. Without God's spirit, it is impossible for a man to do that. They don't even have the choice. Now, to clarify, and I will touch on this on the final video... And of uh, and not the final video that I'll ever post, but on the final video of the subject of Calvinism, we don't believe in absolute predestination. We do believe you have choices. You, we do believe you have the ability to choose some things, but there are things that are beyond your control, such as your salvation and when you are born again and what callings God gives you. Those things are beyond our control. If you're meant to be a part of the church, God will call you into it. But that, but if you have a desire to join a church, if you have a desire to follow Christ, that choice did not come from you or any of us. That came from God touching your heart and putting His Spirit in you, so that you have the, you are made alive, you are born again, and are, and thus. You have the desire to follow. Now, this is where choice comes in. Once you gain that desire, you can either choose to, to act upon it or push it away. And there are some that have pushed it away. But it does not mean you're no longer one of God's children. It does not mean that you are, are, are not going to heaven. For this touches upon the subject that I've brought up quite a few times, which is temporal salvation and eternal salvation. It affects the temporal, but not the eternal. Now, if you are familiar with the subject of predestination and election, then and you probably have questions like, okay, but... Why did God choose some, but not all? 
You said in your previous videos that the elect, God's elect, are not any different than those who he has not predestinated to be his children. That we are all in sin, that if God doesn't give them their spirit, that in fact that they are no different than the rest of the world whom you believe God has not chosen. So why did he choose some, but not all? I got two answers to that question that go hand in hand. One, we don't know. We simply don't know. If we knew, if we knew uh, it wasn't anything we earned, we didn't. We certainly didn't earn it because then that would be a condition that would have to be fulfilled. But the other answer I have is that's simply the wrong question to ask. Why is that the wrong question? Because it's questioning God's will. But there is a way to question it in a way that is respectful. The right question is not whether why God predestinated some, but not others. But the right question is, if we ha are in total depravity, if we are, if we are sinners and we can't do anything that is pleasing to God, why did God predestinate and elect any of us? I don't know why he chose me. I didn't do anything to earn it. I'm, I'm just a poor, foolish sinner that did nothing to earn it. And yet, God took people like me, people like you, all of those that are around the world, for it says that he has a people in every nation, kin, and tongue, and he touched their hearts. He touched your hearts. He touched my heart. He put his spirit into us. And through that, we have been born again. We have been made alive. We are new creatures made in Christ, and we have a desire to follow after Christ and be a part of his church that he set up. Now, the, now this is going to be quite interesting because I have a few scriptures I'd like to read from, a few verses, but here's the interesting part. I'd like to start out with the ninth, in the ninth chapter of Romans, then go to the other verses later on, but then I would like to return to the ninth chapter of Romans again. Kind of brings us into full circle. And it shows just how God's will truly works. And it proves that God's will is unconditional. That his, that in the sense that we are we that he's chosen us, not because of anything we did, but it was done by his mercy and his mercy alone. So in Romans chapter nine, verse eleven, now this is talking about uh uh, Jacob and Esau, which are twins, by the way, twin sons of Isaac. And it has to do with God choosing one over the other, for they are the examples of the elect and the non-elect. So it says, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So right there. We don't understand the mind of God to the fullest. That's impossible. For God's mind exceeds ours. He has more, so much... He has far more wisdom than what we could truly comprehend. I do, do not believe we could contain all the thoughts of God in our minds. It's just impossible. But yet God taken a people long before he ever created the world and divided them into two groups. Before we were ever even born, just as he made his decision before uh, Jacob and Esau were born. Not being born yet, not yet having done any good or evil, that, hit, that uh, his will according to election 
might stand. Not of works, but to him, him being God, who calleth. So we start out in the world. He, he looks upon us. He knew every single one of us that were going to exist long before he ever created anything. God is without beginning and without end. So there was, in fact, a time where it was just God and nothing else. In fact, since he's without beginning, and this, real, this is a hard one to comprehend, that means there was an infinite time span before, anything, before he created anything where it was just him. Now he could have created the world sooner, but that infinite time span would have still been infinite because God is the only being that is without beginning and without end. But despite this fact, he knew ahead of time. He had a plan ahead of time. He planned. There was never a time when he wasn't planning on creating the world. It wasn't some afterthought or something that just occurred to his mind at one point where he was just by himself and then he thought, you know something? I think I'm going to create an entire universe and I'm going to create a perfect kingdom and give people the choice if they want to be a part of my family and my kingdom or if they want to reject it and I'll prepare a place of torment for those who reject me. God already, there was never a time when God didn't have the world in his mind. There was never a time when God didn't have this plan. He, had a, he chose a time to set it in motion, but there was never a time when it was, where the thought just wasn't there yet. It's not like us who just suddenly come up with ideas out of the blue and we act upon them. No. Just as he himself is without beginning and without end, so is his will and his plan is without beginning. Then he created, but before he created all things, he knew every individual that would exist from Adam and Eve all the way up to us, and he knows those who will be born after us. Knows every single, he knows of every single one of them, and he looked through and sorted them out and chose those he wanted to be his children and chose, and prepared because he also knew that Adam and Eve that Adam would cause the original sin and plunge the entire world into sin so just as he himself the father is without beginning without end he prepared his son who is without beginning and without end also because it was through his son that he created all things this is backed up in uh, the first gospel of John where it talks about the word of God and how Jesus is the word but he looked upon us. He didn't, he didn't say to himself, well, look how much better these people are acting compared to these other people. I'm going to choose them. No. God is a perfect being, so he looks at things in a perfect way. While we look at things and measure sin by the damage it can cause, oh, these people are sinners, but these people are worse that's not how God looks at us. He looks at us as sinners, but through his love and his mercy, he has, he has those that he loved, and he cho and he'd chosen and brought and reserved a place in his kingdom for them. And though he knew we were all going to be born in sin, he prepared his son to take on our sins, and to become as a man and take on our sins and died on the cross fulfilling his law that he created so that through his love and his mercy we are saved. Not because of anything we did, but through his unconditional election. We, th through his choosing of us, though we didn't do anything to earn it. The other scripture I 
feel the need to point out really quick and this is where I'm going to start kind of take going a little backwards because I'm skipping all the way to Peter. And Peter says, he begins his epistle by calling himself out by name and he calls out the name of places. Now I apologize. One of the things I have a hard time doing is pronouncing the names of places in the in the Bible. That's where I tend to stumble or slow down in my pronunciation or my words tend to slur a little bit because the names are the hardest thing for me to pronounce, especially the names of the places. So I ask that you bear with me on this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, and Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And this is where this next verse here is one I want us to focus on. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So he names off all these people and he said, and he calls them the elect. But he doesn't just end it there. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Which means God foreknew all of us. He foreknew these people. He knew you would exist long before he created the entire world. And he looked upon you with love. And the evidence of that love is the fact that he has touched your heart. And that, and that right there is how you have a love for God. For it even says in the scriptures, we love him because he first loved us. So his love for us is evident it's that we, or the fact that we have a love for him is evidence that he loved us first. But it says that through, it says, uh, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. So we are sanctified by His Spirit and through the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Nowhere in that scripture is it mentioned that we are sanctified by our works. Nowhere does it say in that scripture that we are His elect or that we are sanctified because we were found to be better than everybody else. Nowhere do we receive the credit. And nowhere are we, it doesn't say we're sanctified because we chose to let Christ into our hearts. Nowhere does it say that. It says elect, meaning God chose us, and we are not only his elect, we are elected by according to his foreknowledge and the sanctification of his spirit. So he elected us. He sanctified us by his spirit. And we were bought with the price of, of the blood of Christ. So we belong to him through those things right there. Also, it says right here, if you turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, starting with the fourth verse, it says this, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Right there. That's evidence. I'll continue on with that verse. But focus on that beginning part first. It says that we're not only chosen, but we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Evidence that he had chosen us before he created all things. Even before the foundation of the world. So this was all right there according to the plan. We don't believe in absolute predestination. And I'll just give you a quick example of what absolute predestination is. There's a difference between absolute predestination and predestinarian predestination. Primitive Baptist, at least the primitive Baptists that I know of, believe in predestinarian predestination, which is the examples I gave earlier, that you, you do have the ability to choose. If I... 
If I were to step down from the stand right now and stand right in front of it as I speak to you, that's because I chose to do it. But if I, if I remain standing up behind the stand as I speak to you right now, that's because I choose to do it. That's a choice. And I can make that choice either way. But there are some, and this is the key point, one of the key points that we differ from Calvinism, is we do not believe in absolute predestination. Absolute predestination is when you can't choose anything. If you do anything whatsoever, it is, according to the belief of absolute predestination, it's not your choice. It was, you're doing it because it was predetermined for you to do it. Which means if I, according to their beliefs, if I did step down and chose to remain, stand in front here as I speak to you, it isn't because I chose to, but it's because it was predestinated that I would do it. That choice and free will is gone completely. You see, a lot of people get hung up on that when it comes to... Uh, to the belief of predestination. They say, well, you're getting, well, this is where it's wrong because free will do, is mentioned in the Bible. It talks about free will offerings and all these things. And yes, I agree. The word free will does appear in the Bible. Predestinarian uh, primitive Baptists, which is what I am, which differ, which is one of the two key points that differs from Calvinism is the fact that we do believe in free will. Like I said, we do believe you have a choice. We just don't believe in 100% free will. We don't, we don't believe that uh, you have the power to make yourself perfect by choosing to be perfect. We don't believe that um, you have the uh, power to choose when to be born again that it's not given to you to do that that you do not have the power to decide for yourself whether if you're going to heaven or not those things are beyond your control but other than that choice is given to you you can choose when God calls you into the church you can choose to act on it or you can choose to push it away but that choice does not determine whether if you're going to heaven or not. That does not determine whether if you're one of God's elect or not. That is beyond your control. Just like in my first video when I mentioned um, the parable about the wheat and the tares. To me, that Jesus didn't just pick random things to symbolize the people here on the earth. He chose them because wheat cannot become tares as they grow. Neither can tares become wheat. They are, and nor do they get to decide what they are in the beginning. They are what they are as they start. And choice is not given to the wheat or the tares. Which means if you are planted as wheat, wheat is what you are. If you're tares, tares is what you are. You cannot shift back and forth. Otherwise, Jesus would have chosen a different parable. He would have chosen a parable of things that can shift back and forth, but he didn't. He chose two. He chose two different um, things that cannot change. So just as the wheat cannot become tares, you cannot do anything to make it so you're no longer one of God's elect, and you did nothing to earn that. That's why it's called unconditional election. Now, some people will I get also hung up on the scripture that says, well, what about the part where it says God is without respect of persons? You see, your belief of election in that sense contradicts that. No, it doesn't. In fact, if you focus on that, on that verse, you'll notice it actually backs up unconditional election. If God had respect of persons, you would have to earn your you would have to earn being one of his elect and then in doing so earning his respect. But God didn't choose us because of anything we did to earn it. He just 
he chose us, and we do not know why. We're not any better. This pro it just kind of, and there was someone I was actually talking to about this, and um, he tried to say uh, he. While I do believe his desire to be with God and to follow after Christ is sincere, he tends to get a little extreme in his examples. He he in his uh, question, he's like. Well, if you really believe that you are one of God's people and you're in a group and the world is divided into two groups, you're either one of God's elect or you're not, isn't that kind of what, um, and this is his example, not mine, he said, isn't this kind of what uh, the Nazis believed in Germany with Hitler and them thinking that they are the superior race? And no. It is nothing like that, because race has nothing to do with it, and they thought they were the superior race. We don't believe we're superior to anybody. If we believed we were superior, how can we believe an unconditional election? We can't. We would have to believe that God chose us because we are some... How is it we're superior? We're not. We're born in sin just as much as everybody else. Without God, we can't do anything right. Without his guidance, we cannot understand the scriptures. Without him touching our hearts, we wouldn't even have desire. And yet, he looked upon us with love and mercy and chose us. Now, How can we honestly feel superior to that when the, none of the credit goes to us? We can't. All the credit goes to God and God alone. He gets the final say. He gets to make the decision. So how can people say we're prideful or that we think we're superior in any way? That would be a direct contradiction to unconditional election. The final scripture I would like to turn to is back at the ninth chapter of Romans again. Now, uh, let's see. Give me a moment. I'm, uh, let's see here. Okay. In the 15th verse, it says this. Well, actually, let me start with the 13th verse. Because this is the part that people tend to cringe and feel uncomfortable with. But I would like to start out with it. And I have read this in a previous video. But it has to do with Jacob and Esau again. And how they are examples of the elect and the non-elect. And this is God speaking right here. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. People back. Now, hold on a second there, Elder Smith. You have gone way too far with this. How can you ever say God hates anybody? God loves everybody. The Bible says so. Where does it say that in the Bible? Where? Also, you got to also look at it from this perspective here. If God loves everybody, why is there eternal torment for those whom he has not called to be, or who, who do not have his spirit. If he loved everybody, wouldn't he, at the end of times, or after the end of times, be in continuous torment himself? What do you mean by that, Elder Smith? What do you mean God would be in eternal torment if he loved all? Here's what I mean. Because after everything has finally been fulfilled, we're all in God's kingdom together, but there's a people 
And if you say God loves everybody, then that means the people that are in the eternal fires of, the, of hell and the lake of fire and brimstone, those are full of people he also loves. So how could he love them and have his heart not break and be in eternal torment over the fact that they are there for all eternity? It doesn't make any sense. And for, some, for those of you that watch this video and our parents, you, I know that you discipline your children whenever they are out of line, that you discipline them and punish them whenever they do things that they ought not to do. But would you ever find it in your heart to ever unleash a punishment on your own children whom you love that would be eternal? Would you be willing to throw those that you love into eternal torment because they did not do the things that they were supposed to do? Or would your heart break and you wouldn't be able to bear the thought of doing it? If you're not willing to do that, then how much less is God willing to do that who loves us far more than he loves you far more than you love your children. And yes, that is true. I will, I will never dare to measure the amount of love you have for your children. But at the same time, even with that said, God's love for us exceeds our love for anything else. So if we ourselves couldn't bear to do that to our children, what makes you think that God would be willing to do that to his own children? If he loved everybody, everybody would be his children. The word elect wouldn't even need to be in the Bible because all would be his. But the fact that, there, that the word election appears more than once, in fact, in the Bible, it's evidence that there are people that are not his elect. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. A lot of people say, well, hold on a second, Elder Smith. While, you, while on the surface, it looks like you have a point there. If you actually take the time to read the surrounding scriptures of the verses you just pointed out, you'll realize it's not talking about the church or the the people, or even eternal salvation at all. It's talking about Israel. In one sense, that is correct. But Paul is using Israel as an example of, of God's unconditional election. Well, how is that? How do, how does, is, what does Israel have to do with God's unconditional election? Here's how. Go back to the beginning. I don't mean the beginning of Adam and Eve, with Adam and Eve. I mean back to Abraham's time where his story begins. How did the story with Abraham begin? Did he first call upon God or did God go to him first? Read that scripture as many times as you want, but it'll always turn up the same. And that is God went to Abraham first. And he commanded Abraham to leave this place, to leave his home, for he would show him a land that he would give him. Now, where a choice comes in, Abraham could have said no and stayed. He didn't, but he could have. That's where the choice comes in. But God did not sit back and wait for Abraham that call on to God. And then God thought to himself, you know what? 
I'm going to reward him by giving him this land. No. He went to Abraham first and gave him the instructions of what he was to do. Now, if, uh, if there was a condition that had to be fulfilled, God would have sat back and waited, but he didn't. He looked at Abraham, and at the time, Abraham wasn't that different from the rest of the people that he lived with, and yet God came to him, and God led him out, and God blessed him throughout his entire life. Also, so Israel, why, did, why was Israel uh, God's people? Did they ask to be God's people? Did God sit back and say, and say to himself, you know what, I'll wait. For a country to rise up, I'll wait for them to call upon my name and ask me to make them my people, and then they shall be my people. No, he chose ahead of time. Why? God himself even told them throughout the, the Old Testament that how rebellious they were. Before he even called them the least of all the countries and the kingdoms out there in the world. Israel's even smaller than the states of Indiana or Ohio. So you got a country that is literally smaller than the majority of the states in the U.S. So it wasn't their numbers. It wasn't because they asked to be. And yet, God ahead of time which was Abraham and Abraham didn't do anything to earn it either. So this so while people try to say, well that's talking about Israel. Well, Israel came about through God's unconditional election also. They are an example of God's unconditional election. Now, bear in mind, I said they are an example of God's unconditional election. They're not all God's elect. For it is, uh, for Paul even mentioned that they are not all Israel who are of Israel. So, being born Jewish by flesh and blood does not make you automatically one of God's elect. You have, uh, just as God has a people in every nation, kin, and tongue, with Israel being no exception to that rule. Once again, Israel's no exception. So, being uh, born flesh and blood as a, a Jewish person just means that you are a flesh and blood descendant of Abraham. But... It's when you're born of the Spirit. That's evidence that you are born of God. And that's the second birth, being born again. And I do believe there are people in Israel who are born of the Spirit. I don't believe they all are. But then again, I don't believe there's any country in the world where every single person is born of God's Spirit. But to those that are, that's evidence that they are God's elect. And that right there is my subject on unconditional election. I thank every single one of you for listening. Um, I'll continue on with this subject as I post more videos. Remember, the study, the show thyself approved, put on the whole armor of God. God bless every single one of you and fight the good fight.